All right, last time we talked about acute infections, which we defined as an infection that is self-limiting. It can be rapid. Some of them are longer than others. But the real key is they're self-limiting. They're over, and hopefully you recover. If you don't recover, it's still an acute infection. Right? Today we're going to talk about persistent infections. The definition is that they last the lifetime of the host. And they're different, as we'll see. We're going to go through some examples of them today. And, but for each virus family within the family, there are the, the characteristics are, are very similar. And these all begin as an acute infection. As we'll see, you have an infection, you have a, a, a period of disease, which looks like an acute infection, but then the virus is not cleared and it stays with you for the rest of your life. So in the first lecture of this course, I talked about how we all are infected with at least a dozen viruses. And these are the persistent viruses that don't go away. So last time we talked about these patterns of infection, where we're looking at time versus virus production. Yes? This lecture is not on the exam. You want to leave now? No. <laughs> <laughs> I just like to confirm because I thought it was so No, it's not. I decided to put this on the final because the final you have three hours and we can put more lectures on that. This one we only have 75 minutes. So, And last time a few people were upset about it, so I, I'm, I'm responsive. OK, uh, so this is a graph of virus production in the blue line over time. And we talked about an acute infection where you have an, uh, a defined period of disease. You have virus production, disease in the red bars, and then it's over. Today we're going to talk about different patterns of persistence where the virus stays with you forever. There can be, there can be disease sometimes. So for example, this second one, we call this a smoldering persistent infection, but I'm, I'm not enamored of smoldering. They're all persistent. Here you have virus production for the life of the animal. And uh, at, after a long time, there can be death, um, or maybe not. We'll talk about some infections today where uh, persistence is characterized by continuous high-level production of virus. Uh, then there are latent infections. The herpes viruses, in particular, are characteristic latent viruses, which simply means that the genome in many of them is quiet. It doesn't do anything. Not all of them, but some of them, as you will see. Uh, and so you have periods of virus production shown by the blue peaks and then periods where there's no virus production at all. And sometimes the periods of virus production coincide with disease, sometimes not. And then you have very long-term persistent infections, um, which differ from the second graph here, these smoldering ones, simply by the fact that the virus is quite low for long periods of time. There's an initial acute infection, uh, very low levels of virus for a long period of time, and then a rise in virus towards the end in death. And this is characteristic of um, HIV infection, which we'll talk about later. Yeah? For the persistent infection latent, does the, based on that graph, does that mean that the virus, product, the virus is just not detectable? So you will see that the genome is there, but they don't make, there's no infectious virus made. And it's not a matter that we can't detect it. We, the, some of these herpes viruses simply don't make virus for long periods of time. We'll, we'll talk about this in some detail. OK, let's talk a little bit about some generalities about persistent infections. In general, the reason why these infections are persistent, because they're not cleared uh, by the immune response. For some of them, as you'll see, you continue to get virus particles, so you have genomes and proteins made. Uh, for, other thems, for other persistent infections, the genomes are present, but there are no proteins made. Uh, for some, the genome is present and a few proteins are made, uh, but you can't find virus particles. And again, there isn't a single mechanism that explains all of persistent infections. They're different, and I'm going to give you an example of different mechanisms today. But in general, uh, there are two characteristics that promote persistence. One, if the virus is not cytopathic. So that means that host defenses are not going to be activated very well. Remember, the cytopathic viruses make good adaptive responses, so they get cleared. The persistent viruses can tend to be not cytopathic, so they're not cleared effectively. And also, these viruses that cause persistent infections tend 
to massively modulate immune responses at multiple levels. So they don't get cleared and they keep, uh, they keep replicating and the infection continues. So these are, this is a table which lists some of the properties of the persistent infections we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about a lot of different virus families, herpes viruses, a variety of hepatitis viruses, um, and the polyoma viruses. <clears throat> First, before we get into the general mechanisms, I want to remind you that immune modulation is very important. We talked about how an infected cell can be detected by cytotoxic T lymphocytes. These are part of the adaptive response, of course. They recognize viral peptides that are being displayed in MHC molecules on the surface of the infected cell. Uh, and they, so that's why we call this infected self, because not only is there a viral peptide there, but it's presented in an MHC molecule, which the CTL recognizes as self. CTL will then kill this cell. This reaction is antagonized at many levels by different viruses. We've talked a little bit about this, but I just wanted to bring it up again because it's, it's why you get persistence with many of these viruses. So here's a, a larger view of the presentation of a viral peptide in MHC1 uh, to a CTL, which is on the top there. Uh, and you can see the infected cell proteins, viral proteins, being put through the proteasome to generate peptides. These are then pumped into the ER lumen uh, via the TAP, the transporter for antigen processing. It's put into the MHC1 molecule, which is then shipped to the surface by the secretory pathway. And you can see by these red lines, these show you viral proteins that are interrupting this pathway. They start down at transcription of the MHC uh, mRNAs in the nucleus. And viruses can antagonize that. Uh, viruses can, for example, antagonize the transporter itself to prevent the peptides from getting in. They can antagonize the transport of the MHC, the loaded MHC, to the cell surface. And they can also cause the MHC on the surface to be withdrawn. We call that downregulation. It's a property of several viral proteins. And in fact, one of them sends the MHC to the lysosome to be degraded. So these are all ways of antagonizing MHC1 presentation. The result, of course, is the infected cell is no longer recognized by a CTL. So it won't be lysed. It'll continue to be pre uh, infected and pr produce virus particles. Another mechanism of escape, which we only mentioned briefly uh, in our adaptive discussion, is the elaboration of CTL escape mutants. Again, viral peptides are presented to CTLs in the context of MHC1. Viruses can evolve during an infection or between infections to make the sequences of these peptides different. And that, the consequence of that is shown on the left here. So here is a different view of the MHC1 uh, molecule. These are the gray guys here. And here's a viral peptide fitting nicely into the groove on the MHC1. And this will eventually be put up on the cell surface. We're showing this in the ER lumen here. But changes in the sequence of the peptide, which is not very long, shown, one of them shown here in blue, prevent the peptide from binding to the MHC, so it can't be presented. These changes can also prevent CTL recognition. So now we're on the cell surface. Here is uh, the MHC presenting the peptide to the T cell receptor on the uh, CD8 cell. That also, that protein on the CD8 cell also recognizes the viral peptide. So when the viral peptide changes, that interaction can be disrupted as well. So it not only doesn't bind very well uh, to the uh, MHC1 molecule, but it could also not be recognized by CD8. And finally, these changes in the peptide can also affect proteasomal processing so that the peptides aren't even made to begin with. So simply by changing the amino acid sequence of the protein, you can avoid MHC1 presentation. So you can imagine how this happens. Viruses uh, are extremely error-prone in their replication, so they're always making variants with changes in the amino acid sequence of their proteins. And so if one of these variants randomly arises that makes the virus resistant to, to uh, MHC1 presentation, that'll be selected for, and that will predominate. Another interesting way that viruses 
become persistent by immune avoidance is by killing the CTL. Now the, the goal of the CTL of course is to lyse a virus infected cell, uh, but viruses have a trick to get around that. Now on the surface of CTLs there is a protein uh, called FAS, it's a receptor shown here in the middle, also called CD95 or APO1, but I'll use the term FAS. It's this transmembrane receptor. And when that, um, when that FAS receptor engages the FAS ligand, which is FASL, the blue protein here, it kills the cell. It kills the cell by inducing apoptosis. So this receptor is on a variety of cells. It's also on CTLs because in certain places or at certain times, you want to get rid of the CTLs. You don't want them anymore. You don't need them. Um, in particular, in the, in the eye, uh, you don't want a lot of CTL activity because it's going to damage the eye. So the, the FAS is there to regulate the CTLs. Well, guess what? <laughs> Viruses have evolved to induce FASL on the surface of infected cells. So when the CTL engages the infected cell by recognizing the peptide in MHC1, the infected cell also has FASL on its surface, which is upregulated by the virus. It binds the FAS on the surface of the CTL and it kills it. So the virus kills the CTL instead of the CTL killing uh, the virus infected cell. So that's an example of virus defense against the offense. So that again pr promotes persistence because the infected cell will not be destroyed. There are also a variety of places in animals that we call, that have reduced immune surveillance. For example, uh, the, the central nervous system has reduced immune surveillance, the vitreous humor of the eye, certain areas of lymphoid drainage. They do not want to have a lot of immune activity because that would damage these tissues. And as I said, the eye has high fast L in it so that uh, it can prevent CTLs from working there. These are areas where persistent infections often begin because there's not a, a lot of immune defense there because these are privileged sites and they need to be preserved. So viruses get into them, they're not cleared and they just remain there for a long time. Finally, many viruses can infect immune cells and this is another mechanism of persistence. We talked about how measles virus can infect various lymphocytes and other immune cells. Uh, HIV infects CD4 T cells, the helper cells that make cytokines that help differentiate the adaptive response, also infects other cell types. And this, of course, destroys the ability of the immune response to clear the infection and that promotes persistence as well. And HIV, of course, persists for many, many years uh, before the host eventually dies of opportunistic infections. So those are different ways that immune antagonism can allow the virus to replicate so that it will uh, be persistent. So our first question is which of the following are features of persistent infections? One, they last the lifetime of the host. Two, viral immune modulation is involved. Three, immune cells may be infected. Four, they may occur in areas of reduced immune surveillance. Or five, all of the above. You all answered E, which is correct. All of the above. These are all features of persistent infections. All right, let's go through a number of viruses that cause persistent infections so you can understand the different ways they do this. The first is measles virus. Yeah, we talked about this last time as an acute infection, but in some cases can cause a persistent infection. This is a paramyxovirus that only infects humans, highly contagious. 2011, 158,000 deaths, completely preventable because our vaccine works very well. Uh, and it, this is one of these viruses that immunosuppresses, and this may play a role uh, in its persistence. There is a disease that occurs uh, a number of years after primary measles called SSPE, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. This is a progressive degenerative infection of the brain encephalitis, and the rate is about one per million cases of measles. Of the million kids who get measles, one of them goes on to develop SSPE, has about a six to eight year incubation. We don't really understand what's going on. It's very difficult to study because we don't have animal models. 
but in individuals who have died, it's known that there are viral nucleoproteins present in the brain. Uh, that's, of course, RNA bound to protein. There's no infectious virus present, yet the genome is there and apparently can spread between neurons, which, of course, are synaptically connected. So the genome is present as a ribonucleoprotein for many years, uh, and it causes this disease. We don't understand what allows it to persist, but it is in the CNS, which is a privileged site, uh, and we don't know what causes the disease. But it's an example of how an acute infection can have a persistent phase under some conditions. Next set of viruses I want to talk about are the polyomaviruses. These are small DNA-containing icosahedral viruses. SV40 is a polyomavirus. We talked about SV40. Right here is SV40 um, a long time ago because we uh, have learned a lot about DNA replication by studying it. There are quite a few uh, different polyomaviruses. You can see this phylogenetic th tree comparing the nucleotide sequences of them. Uh, there's some avian polyomaviruses here. Uh, and then um, the ones with an asterisk, a red asterisk, these are polyomaviruses that have been isolated uh, from people. So these down here, BKJC, TSP, MCP, uh, and these up here. These have also been isolated from Wookiees. That's, that's an example of a Wookiee. Um, but these HP, Y, 6, and 7, V, and W, U uh, are all human isolates as well. The name Wookiee comes from W, U, W, Washington University, which is where one of these viruses was isolated. And KI is the Karolinska Institute in um, Sweden, where the other one's a Wookiee. The virologists have sense of humor, too. Right? These viruses are in all of you. I bet if I did a sero survey of you, I'd find antibodies to at least one in, in just about all of you. We all get infected for life. We are infected quite early in life. Pro we don't really know how we acquire infection, probably by respiratory routes, probably uh, from virus in urine or other respir or re respiratory secretions. They infect a variety of organs, as you can see. And and people who have been looked at, there's lots of these virus particles in urine, up to 100,000 particles per milliliter. And so, as I said, I think earlier in this course, uh, you know, I, when you go to the public restroom, those urinals or toilets are full of everybody else's polyomaviruses. And when, uh, you know, when you flush toilets, you make an aerosol, so you're inhaling someone else's viruses. And you get, again, you get these at birth. We don't know why they persist. They infect you as there's no evidence that there's any disease in a healthy person whatsoever. If, however, you're immunosuppressed, you can have problems. So if you get an organ transplant, if you get AIDS, or another one is, here's an interesting one. People with multiple sclerosis are given immunosuppressive monoclonal antibodies, which really helps treat their disease. A number of those individuals uh, get disease caused by these polyomaviruses. And this disease is called progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, or PML. This is a brain disease caused by these polyomaviruses that replicate like crazy when you get immunosuppressed. So, in a normal, healthy person, our immune systems are keeping them in check, they're preventing them from causing disease. They replicate quite high in all these different organs, but if you get uh, immunosuppressed for a variety of reasons, uh, you can get very sick. So these infections were quite rare in the pre-AIDS era, but since AIDS, we've seen them more and more as we have many, many people who are being immunosuppressed by HIV infections. All right, the next one is hepatitis B virus, which we've also talked about in this course as a model for a virus with reverse transcriptase. Remember, these are DNA-containing icosahedral particles with an envelope. And these, of course, as the name tells you, cause infection of the liver, hepatitis. They are transmitted by exposure to blood. The virus has, establishes a viremia, virus particles in the blood. And that's how it gets from person to person during uh, childbirth, 
if you have contaminated blood into transfusion, hopefully we don't do that anymore because we check all the blood for uh, the presence of the virus. Sex will also transmit it. Uh, drug use with uh, dirty needles will do it. Uh, and there have been nosocomial uh, infections as well in the hospital. And the main target of this virus is the hepatocyte. Whatever the route of infection, the virus goes to the liver and it replicates in hepatocytes. So if you're an adult and you get infected uh, with this virus, 90% of the time you will clear it. You'll have an acute infection of a brief period and then you will clear the infection. Newborns are less likely to clear it and that should make sense because newborns of course don't have a well-developed immune system and the virus will persist. The problem with hepatitis B virus is that it establishes in a certain number of individuals a chronic or persistent infection. And at the moment, the estimate is that about 350 million people uh, globally have a chronic HBV infected. They're infected for life. And this is a problem because in the liver, the continuous replication leads to liver cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma. And these two graphs show you the difference between acute hepatitis B which occurs in adults when they get infected versus chronic hepatitis B. Uh, and these are looking at time after exposure to the virus. And on the y-axis, we're looking at a variety of parameters. We're looking at some viral antigens um, in, in red here. So for example, at the onset of infection, there's a steep rise in, in what's called HBSAG. This is one of the viral proteins, essentially. You see it peaks at about 10 weeks or so and then declines, and these are when the symptoms are peaking, about right at the peak of antigen production. Uh, it's eventually cleared and the infection is over. You see the viral DNA is shown here in green. Uh, that's gone after about a year or so. And you make antibodies to the viral proteins, <clears throat> these anti-graphs uh, here are the antibodies. And then finally, you can see the period of liver disease is marked by the black line. Uh, <clears throat> this is an enzyme produced uh, in the liver, which normally doesn't enter the circulation, but when the liver cells are broken by virus infection, uh, this, this enzyme gets in the blood, it can be readily detected. So it's a nice marker of uh, hepatitis because you just take a blood sample and you can measure the enzyme. You can see that peaks with the viral antigens uh, and then, then goes away. So that's an acute infection. It comes and gone, it, it's, it's cleared. It does take a long time, it takes many, many weeks but eventually it's over. And that's in contrast to chronic hepatitis B, where you can see that the uh, viral DNA in green continues to be present for over a year. It's never cleared. Uh, the liver enzyme continues to be present in the blood. The viral protein HBS antigen continues to be present uh, as well. So that's a chronic infection. You're making virus particles continuously uh, and the liver is getting uh, slowly destroyed. Now the virus itself is not cytopathic. So remember one of the predispositions to persistence is that the virus is not cytopathic so you don't make a great immune response against it. Uh, in this infection what kills the hepatocytes are cytotoxic T lymphocytes. So you can imagine during a chronic infection your liver is continuously infected, CTLs are continuously killing the liver cells, that causes eventually fibrosis in the liver which leads to cirrhosis and liver failure. Uh, and then um, after 20 or 30 years of this, you may also de develop hepatocellular carcinoma. So this, is, this infection is a risk factor for liver cancer and that's why it, it is such a problem. We do have a vaccine, we do have antivirals uh, for this infection, uh, but um, in many individuals, they don't seem to be inf uh, effective at clearing the infection. So an example of <clears throat> a persistent infection where viruses are always produced. Here's another one that's liver tropic or hepatotropic, hepatitis C virus. This is a virus of a different family. Viruses from multiple families can cause hepatitis. Uh, these are flaviviruses. These are RNA-containing viruses, plus-stranded RNA with an icosahedral shell surrounded by an, an envelope with viral glycoproteins in it. Uh, these are also transmitted by exposure to contaminated blood. The virus establishes a viremia. It can be transmitted during sex, drug use, or even during birth, where there's a lot of blood, of course, and the, and the infant can be infected at delivery. Virus goes into uh, the liver, 
and replicates in hepatocytes, just like hepatitis B virus. At the moment, about 2% of the human population is infected with this, 185 million people or so. A lot of effort to um, develop antivirals to cure these infections. Just read an article this morning. There's a few new drugs have been released in the past year, and they're incredibly expensive. I think the course of infection of a six or a 12 week treatment to cure someone costs over $150,000. Companies are trying to recover the money they invested in it. And I think in the US alone, Medicare has, it has cost Medicare over $5 billion to treat people who are infected with this virus, with these new antivirals. It's incredibly expensive. I mean, it's gonna cure their infection and they'll be good as a consequence, but wow, is it expensive. So initially when you get infected with the virus, you have an acute infection. Interestingly, often asymptomatic, but if it's not asymptomatic, typical signs of hepatitis, liver damage, liver enzymes in the blood, perhaps jaundice, a little yellow color to your skin. But in a number of individuals, you can also develop a chronic infection where you have high levels of virus particles in the blood. And of course, that's how you would spread it uh, to someone else. So here on the left is a path showing you the different outcomes uh, of infection. So you get an acute infection. 60 to 85 percent of these individuals uh, will go on to have a chronic infection. So the remainder re resolve spontaneously. Of those who get a chronic infection, uh, 5 to 20 percent after 25 years will develop cirrhosis of the liver, liver damage caused by the continuous replication of the virus and the destruction of immune cells. And of those individuals, about 7% will then go on to develop liver cancer as well. So these are not huge numbers, as you can see, but for those individuals who progress, uh, it's not a happy outcome. On the right is the pattern of uh, virus production and liver enzyme again, the liver enzyme that we looked at previously in these two different disease states. So here is the acute infection in red. You can see with time, uh, a month or two after infection, there's a peak uh, of virus. This is viral RNA in the, in the red line. Uh, it's eventually cleared. Uh, and the liver enzyme, ALT, also peaks at the same time. So those are the individuals who clear the infection. They have a three or four month acute infection, and then they're healthy. And the other individuals who go on to be chronically infected, they're shown in blue here. You can see the viral RNA persists at high levels continuously. They have virus in the blood all the time. Uh, and the, vi the uh, liver enzymes are also uh, elevated. They have a general downward trend because the liver is being destroyed uh, in these individuals. So another example of a persistent or chronic infection where virus is present. This uh, graph shows you the burden of uh, three very important diseases, hepatitis B that we've talked about, hepatitis C, and HIV, which we'll talk about later. This is the age-adjusted mortality rate per 100,000 people over different years. And you can see, you know, we're, we're doing well in treating HIV. Fewer and fewer people are dying. Uh, hepatitis B is more or less stable, but hep C is going up because the individuals who've been infected, uh, they're starting to reach the phase of their lives where they're, they're encountering serious liver disease and they're dying. And this uh, infection continues to spread in certain populations, even though we know it's trans spread by infected blood, uh, people continue to do things that make them at risk. Uh, the clearance, those who clear HCV, remember there are a certain fraction of people in who this is an acute infection and then they clear it and they're fine. Uh, in some of those, the clearance is associated with a, an allele of interferon lambda, and this has been determined by genome-wide association studies. So certain sequences in the interferon lambda predispose you to doing, having a better outcome. The reason that hep C persists is it has multiple uh, immune avoidance mechanisms, uh, very much like some of the ones we talked about earlier. Next question, what are shared features of persistent infections with polyomavirus, hepatitis B virus, and hepatitis C virus? One, genomes are present but not expressed. Two, liver damage. Three, kidney damage. Four, virus particles are produced. Five, all of the above. All right, let's see how you did. Hmm. All right, the question was shared features of persistent infections. Uh, genomes are present but not expressed isn't correct because virus particles are produced. Remember polyomas in the urine, uh, hep B and hep C in the blood, 
in the liver. So the genomes have to be expressed. The polyomas don't cause liver damage. <clears throat> the polyomas cause kidney damage, but you didn't pick that, so that's good. Um, the answer is D, which most of you got 36%. Virus particles are produced. That's the common feature of polyoma, hep B, and hep C persistent infections. Well, the others aren't correct. All right, now we're going to spend the remainder of the time talking about persistent infections, which are also considered latent because in some cases only the genome is present and no viruses are produced. And we'll see how this works out. So uh, gene products that promote replication are either not found or they're in low concentrations. And as a consequence, if you have a cell with a genome in it, it's not going to be recognized by the immune system, so it's not eliminated. But that genome is intact, and at some point it can be turned on again to make new virus particles so it can spread to another person. It doesn't do a virus any good if it goes latent in one person and never spreads. When that person dies, that'll be the end of the infection. So as you will see, interesting strategies have evolved to ensure spread uh, to other people. We're going to talk about a number of herpes viruses now. And according to the herpes virus, the DNA is in a different configuration during this persistent infection. So for example, for herpes simplex virus and varicella zoster virus, we have non-replicating DNA in a cell that doesn't divide. And that's neurons, of course. Uh, in Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, uh, human papillomaviruses, even HBV, and, and another herpes virus, Kaposi's sarcoma herpes virus, we have self-replicating DNA in a dividing cell. And finally, human herpes virus 6, uh, the DNA is actually integrated into the host chromosome, at least in a certain fraction of people, and it replicates with the host. So these, most of these are the herpes viruses, which pretty much all of you have as well. So in addition to those uh, polyoma viruses, we all have herpes viruses in, in different compartments in us. And we're fine. Periodically, we may have disease and spread infection. If you get immunosuppressed, you can be in big trouble for the polyomas and the herpes viruses as well. So let's start with herpes simplex virus. This is a rel relatively large DNA virus uh, envelope, which we've talked about in terms of DNA replication and gene expression before. Over 80% of the US is seropositive for this virus, and the genomes are in the peripheral nervous system. So 80% at least have genomes in the peripheral nervous system. Just think about that right now. In your ganglia, you have viral genomes sitting there ready to replicate. Millions of people are carrying these genomes, and you have no symptoms. About 40 million people uh, in the US experience recurrent herpes disease. That is, the production of a fever sore. These can be, herpes simplex viruses can infect uh, the lips, the, the mouth, and the genital tract. They're two different viruses, and they can cause uh, fever sores at either site. They're two different viruses. HSV1 is typically oral. HSV2 is typically genital lesions. So I think this is a really well-adapted pathogen. Most of the time, you don't have disease. Uh, the, the virus is quiet, but periodically, it reactivates, makes a fever sore. You transmit infection to someone else, but the fever sore is a mild infection. Uh, and so the virus has adapted well. How does the infection work? When you are very young, you acquire the virus probably, it could be at birth. If your mother has genital herpes at birth, that's shedding virus and it will infect the baby. Or if not, shortly after birth, your parents will be kissing you and if they have a fever sore shedding virus, they'll infect you. In some people, viruses shed even in the absence of a sore, so you don't even know you're shedding. The virus infects mucosal surfaces, mucosal uh, genital area or the oropharynx. Here are some uh, mucosal cells at the top here. Uh, the virus enters those cells, replicates in them, and they can be released at the basal lateral side of those cells. Uh, and then the viruses enter nerve endings. They can enter sensory nerve endings or sympathetic uh, nerve endings, and then the viruses can travel up into the neuron cell body. All right, this is a peripheral ganglion here. We're not getting into the CNS. We're stopping at a peripheral ganglion, uh, and there the virus uh, remains 
silent just as DNA. It can happen again in a sensory neuron or in a sympathetic neuron. Um, and in the ganglia, which is diagrammed here, uh, the genome is silenced. So here is our epithelial sheet that was originally infected. It's of course innervated and the virus comes off the epithelial cells, enters the nerve ending, and makes its way into the neuron, the cell body of the neuron, and the, the, the DNA remains there quiet. You typically have multiple copies of episomal DNA. That means the DNA is separate from the cell chromosome. It's not integrating. And that's it. The neuron doesn't divide, of course, so the DNA of the virus doesn't have to divide. If this were a dividing cell, the, vir the viral DNA would have to divide with it, but it's not. And unlike love, herpes is forever. You cannot get rid of it. You can't get rid of that DNA in your ganglia. It's there forever. Drugs won't do it. It's not replicating. Vaccines don't do it. You're stuck with it. And, uh, and again, most of us have uh, herpes. I'm sure I do. I have never had a fever sore as far as I know, but I'm sure I have herpes virus in my ganglia. And I'm one of those people who never gets uh, the, the fever sore, but probably I shed it periodically. And uh, well, I'm just lucky, I guess. <laughs> the, um, the only thing that is made, the only molecule that's produced from this genome is what's called a LAT a latency-associated transcript in, and some microRNAs. The LAT is a mRNA, it's, not an, it's an RNA that does not encode for any protein. It's not translated into any protein, uh, but it's apparently important to maintain the latent state. So there's a LAT that's produced. There are also a variety of microRNAs, and these apparently are silencing host genes to allow the virus DNA to remain there uh, and persist. Apparently, they're also the host contributes to this silencing in ways as well that we don't quite understand. So the DNA is present in the neuron in the nucleus. It's making this single RNA, the lat RNA, and a number of microRNAs that are important to maintain the persistent state. At periodic intervals, this genome becomes what we call reactivated. A small number of neurons reactivate. The DNA begins to uh, become transcribed to make messenger RNAs. You make new virus particles. Those viruses travel down the nerve, enter a grade transport. They reach the mucosal surface. They replicate in these mucosal epithelial cells. They're shed in the apical surface, and that produces the cold sore, fever blister, whatever you want to call it, and that's how virus is shed. So that's how you transmit infection, when this uh, latent infection is reactivated and you make new virus particles. The, um, the reason this works is that it's very quick. After reactivation, the virus particles travel very quickly to the nerve before the immune response can intervene. Remember, the DNA is already in the cell, ready to go, can make particles very quickly before you can have an immune response that clears it. Eventually, the fever sore goes away because your antibodies are or cellular immune responses kick in and clear the infection, but not before you have shed virus and transmitted it to someone else. So it's really a brilliant strategy. Some people, unfortunate individuals, reactivate every two to three weeks. And they can have fever sores or not. Of course, if you have a fever sore every two to three weeks, this is not fun because it, it, it's painful. Others never reactivate. Some people actually never make virus. And some people make virus in the absence of symptoms. So this is a really uh, slick infection. The virus is not terribly harmful, and it manages to spread through almost the entire population by this strategy. I just want to show you the nerve where this virus goes to. When you get your initial infection as a baby, it's typically in the respiratory tract. It can be in the mouth or on the lips. And these areas are innervated by these nerves. There's one set of nerves that go to your upper jaw, another set goes to the, your lower, and a third uh, goes to your eye. And these all come together at what's called the trigeminal ganglion. It's a collection of neurons here. And it's in this ganglion that the herpes viral DNA resides. It's just right on either side of your head, just before your ears. And um, when you get, that's where the DNA goes and becomes latent. And then when you're reactivated, 
uh, the virus particles proceed down the nerves and you can get a fever sore on the upper lip or the lower lip. And remember we talked about herpes keratitis, <clears throat> the blindness that can be caused by herpes virus. That happens when uh, the virus goes up uh, to the eye by the other nerve. <clears throat> what reactivates the virus? A variety of triggers. Sunburn, probably the ultraviolet light, uh, somehow reactivates infection. Physical or emotional stress. Uh, many of you probably recognize that you know, when, when you have particular stress, whatever it may be, sometimes you get a fever sore. Even when you get a fever from another illness, that can also uh, trigger uh, reactivation. Nerve damage, hormonal imbalance, steroids, and many different things can trigger reactivation. And, and what happens is you begin to transcribe the viral DNA. You activate the viral transcriptional program. If you remember, the herpes genome is quite long double-stranded DNA, uh, and you have to make the messages in a timed series of events. Uh, you first make uh, immediate early proteins, which then turn on early proteins, which then turn on DNA replication and late protein expression to produce capsids. In experimental models, there are animal models for latency and reactivation. Adding just ICP0 is enough to reactivate the genome. So um, that's clearly important for turning on the transcriptional program. So somehow these triggers tie into turning on transcription. And it has to do with the state of the chromatin and its methylation, its openness, and so forth. We're just beginning to get an understanding of how this works. All right, recurrence or persistence of herpes simplex virus in nerve ganglia requires which of the following? One, continuous episomal DNA replication. Two, low level production of virions. Three, silencing of all gene expression except LAT and microRNA. Four, UV light, stress, or steroids. Five, all of the above. So 57% of you said C, silencing of all gene expression except LAT and microRNA. That's correct. That is what uh, persistence requires. You don't need episomal DNA replication, right? This is persistence. The neuron is not multiplying, so the viral DNA doesn't have to multiply. Uh, UV light stress and steroid is the reactivation, it's not the persistence, and of course then it's not all of the above. All right, the next herpes virus, so these are all viruses in the family herpes viridae. Talked about herpes simplex virus types one and two. Next, Epstein-Barr virus, another large DNA containing virus. Even more US adults are seropositive for this virus, over 95%, and they all also carry the viral genome, just like herpes simplex virus. And studies have been, have been done which show that <clears throat> if you're not seropositive, by the time you go to college, then you will be by the time you leave. Because this is an infection that is transmitted largely uh, by saliva, so it's also called the kissing disease. It, the genome resides in B lymphocytes, so it's different from herpes simplex, which resides in the ganglia. By the way, for the oral herpes, it's the trigeminal ganglia that harbor the genomes. Of course, for, for genital herpes, it's the sacral ganglia that harbor uh, the virus. And most people are infected at an early age and the infection is largely asymptomatic. But it can cause uh, apparent infections or diseases, including infectious mononucleosis. Many, many of you have probably had this. This is a, a disease where you, you're, you're quite tired and it's accompanied by shedding of virus. It can also lead to cancers. Hodgkin's lymphoma is caused by Epstein-Barr virus, um, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, and Burkitt's uh, lymphoma. And these happen, some of these happen here uh, in the U.S. as well. How does the infection proceed? Again, these viruses infect at mucosal surfaces, primarily the respiratory tract, not the alimentary tract. Here's a mucosal surface. Primary infection, the virus comes in, you acquire it from someone else's saliva or respiratory secretions, it infects the, the uh, respiratory mucosa, uh, virus is produced and it's shed on the basolateral side. Underneath the mucosa are, among other cells, resting B cells. These are cells that will one day make some antibodies. They get infected by the virus. The virus likes to infect B cells. It then transforms these B cells uh, into cells that almost look like they're ready to produce antibodies. It actually pushes them through the, the differentiation cycle to becoming a plasma cell. 
Uh, and this is uh, one of the manifestations of infectious mononucleosis, high level replication in B cells. Uh, here the, the B cell has gone from the mucosa into the blood, so it's spreading throughout the body. And the virus uh, is produced in the B cells, it infects other B cells, and that's part of the effect of mononu infectious mononucleosis. You will shed uh, the virus in your saliva, it's, it's brought back by infected B cells, and that's how you spread it to someone else. After your initial um, acute infection, you recover from infectious mononucleosis, the virus remains latent in B cells. They can circulate, they can go to various places, but the genome is in there, the virus is latent, and you have no more disease. But periodically, uh, these genomes will reactivate. We don't really understand reactivation in this case compared with herpes simplex virus. Uh, but the cells will reactivate, start to make virus particles. Our immune response can handle most of those. So I show here cytotoxic T cells and natural killer cells controlling infection. But periodically, an infected cell will make it uh, to the mucosal area, shed virus there, which will infect the mucosal cells and be shed in the saliva or respiratory secretion. So that's how you would spread it to someone else. So you can have periodic reactivations where you shed virus in the absence of any disease. So it's a little bit different from herpes because usually you have a cold sore there. And that's how it gets into another person. But it's the B cells in which the genome resides. So what does the infection look like in B cells? The DNA is present as a self-replicating episome because the B cells, unlike neurons, are, are uh, dividing. And the genome is associated with nucleosomes. The, there is a limited repertoire of viral messenger RNAs produced. So unlike herpes simplex virus, where, where just the lat and some microRNAs are produced, a few more, a few mRNAs are actually produced, uh, which uh, give rise to viral proteins. Uh, these B cells also, by, in addition to circulating in the blood, can also go to the bone marrow and lymphoid organs where they will harbor the latent genome. Uh, these cells are not killed by cytotoxic T lymphocytes or antibodies unless they, they are reactivation and uh, unless reactivation occurs and virus proteins are made and virus particles are made. So in the latent state, the cells are not eliminated. That's why they persist. As soon as infection occurs, they are targets for the immune response, particularly the adaptive response, and that can eliminate a lot of the cells. But again, some of them escape to mucosal surfaces to shed virus and spread to other people. And this is in part because uh, the virus is very good at modulating MHC uh, using ways that we talked about before. An interesting thing has to happen in the life cycle of this virus. So there's a phase uh, where um, the, the virus is latent in B cells. Um, and it just has to divide every time the B cell divides. It doesn't have to divide a lot. So there's, a, there's an origin of replication called OREP, um, and that is a low copy number uh, origin, which doesn't drive much DNA synthesis, but you don't need a lot of replication in a B cell because it doesn't divide very often. When the infection is reactivated, you need high copy number <coughs> DNA synthesis so you can make a lot of particles. So the virus switches to a different origin of replication called the ORI-LIT for lytic replication. This gives you lots of genomes so you can make lots of virus particles to ensure uh, that the virus is spread. So we talked earlier in this course about how some viral DNA genomes have multiple origins of replication. So EBV has two and they have distinct functions, one for when the virus is resting in B cells, the other for when it's replicating actively and making lots of virus particles. All right, the next herpes virus is varicella zoster virus. And this causes two different kinds of disease which are uh, specified in the name of the virus. Varicella is chickenpox. It's a childhood rash that you acquire from other infected children uh, by the respiratory route. So kids who are infected with, uh, with chicken pox, not only do they have a rash on their skin, but they are shedding virus in the respiratory tract. So another child will inhale that virus. It will replicate uh, in lymphoid cells. This virus likes to replicate in immune cells as well, in particular tonsil or T cells. Uh, it gets into the blood, causes the rash. Uh, but at the same time, the virus makes its way into uh, neurons. These are also peripheral nervous system neurons. 
but they're the ganglia around the spinal cord, the so-called dorsal root ganglia uh, and anterior root ganglia. Those are present right next to the spinal cord, and in those is where the genome of this virus goes uh, to be latent. Many years later, the genome can be activated, reactivated. Uh, the virus is produced in the root ganglia, and they proceed by anterograde transport through the nerve uh, to the skin, where they cause the second disease, zoster, or shingles. And this is the typical rash of shingles. So this rash is not distributed over the entire body, as is the rash of chickenpox. This rash is limited to the areas of skin, they're called the dermatome, that are innervated by the nerve coming from the particular ganglia. So the virus only becomes latent in very specific dorsal root ganglia. You know, they can be at different levels, and you can get this rash at different levels of your body. You can even get it on your legs, depending on uh, where the virus goes latent. So two diseases, the first childhood disease, chickenpox, uh, then the virus becomes latent, and then many years later, the second manifestation is uh, zoster or shingles. 99% of adults were seropositive for this virus before we started uh, immunizing children now. Uh, receive a chickenpox vaccine to prevent chickenpox. It's a nasty disease, it's very painful, and of course you spread it to others, so it's good to stop it. Um, so 99% pre-vaccine were, were infected. About 30% of those then went on to develop zoster or shingles, most of them uh, at greater than 50 years of age. So we now actually have a second vaccine for this virus, which is meant for people who are older, who never received the chickenpox vaccine, who acquired chickenpox, and are at risk for shingles. So we can give them a shingles vaccine and prevent that, because that's painful and can spread virus to others as well. And of course, if you're immunocompromised, which is more likely as you get older, this can be a very serious infection. In the uh, neurons where the virus is in the, in the peripheral neurons where the virus is latent, there's a limited expression of viral genes but no virus particles are made, so more genes than in herpes viruses. Uh, and at some point, to produce shingles, the viral genome has to be reactivated. Doesn't seem to be reactivated in between, but only when you have shingles. And the triggers for that are really unknown. Um, you know, they're not as, as nicely uh, described as for herpes simplex viruses. So that's another herpes virus that infects, hides in Neurons, much like herpes simplex virus, is quiet except for the synthesis of some viral proteins and then at a trigger is reactivated and that allows it to spread also to other individuals. The next herpes virus, cytomegalovirus, HCMV, again very high seroprevalence, anywhere from 50 to 99 percent globally. This is a chart, a graph of CMV seroprevalence. Uh, in different age groups. So here's 18, 8 to 14 years of age going up to 75 years and higher. You can see the seroprevalence uh, gradually increasing as more and more individuals are infected. And it de depending on the ethnic group, uh, it can vary as well. This virus is transmitted by respiratory routes, uh, very much like um, the viruses we've talked about so far, the herpes viruses, virus in saliva, but also in urine can be transmitted by virus in urine, and it can be sexually transmitted as well. This virus replicates in peripheral white blood cells, as well as cells that make up the blood vessels, the endothelial cells. So it has a slightly different tropism than the other viruses we've talked about. So you get an initial infection. Uh, this can typically happen early in life. It can be infected at birth uh, from your mother. Um, or again by saliva or respiratory secretions provided by your parents. Uh, and you may or may not have a, a mild disease, but you shed virus in saliva and urine for months to years. So this is a little different from the other herpes viruses we've talked about, which go quiescent after a, a brief period of time. This one is shedding uh, and be, this virus is being produced for quite a period of time. Eventually, your immune system will dampen the production of virus. 
this virus has many different ways to antagonize the immune system and that's why it persists. But eventually in a healthy person, the levels of viruses go down, but the virus remains present, at least the genome remains present in a variety of cells, including myeloid cells in the bone marrow. And these of course are precursors of a variety of cells in the blood, monocytes, macrophages, and dendritic cells. So these myeloid cells have the genome, they migrate out to differentiate and then they have the virus in them uh, as well. So we all have this virus in this. Some of us might be making virus, some of us may have very low levels of virus. The real problem, there are two really serious problems here. One is if you're immunosuppressed and a big, a big risk factor is organ transplantation. Uh, this is happening more and more often as we get better at doing it and getting better at immunosuppressing people so that they won't reject the organ. We have great drugs and immunotherapies to do this. The problem is since everyone has this virus, you come in for a liver transplant, they immunosuppress you, you get a new liver, but at the same time you get a fulminant CMV reactivation and you can die of that. And so entire uh, units have uh, developed in hospitals which deal simply with uh, transplant patients and their infectious diseases that arise uh, after immunosuppression. And CMV is one of the major ones because so many people have it and it can replicate in so many cells, especially after immunosuppression. The other problem with this virus, another major one, is that the virus can cross the placenta. So most mothers are infected with this virus. If you happen to be making a lot of virus in the blood at the time uh, of, of fetal development, the virus will cross the placenta, get into the fetus, infect it, and cause a lot of problems like congenital uh, defects and even death. So uh, it, this is very important to sort out early on to make sure that this won't be an issue. All right, this question is, what do persistent infections with Epstein-Barr virus varicella zoster virus and cytomegalovirus have in column, common. One, B cells are essential for latent infection. Two, may cause congenital birth defects. Three, viral DNA persists as an episome. Four, the factors governing reactivation are well known. Five, all of the above. All right, 78% of you got C, viral DNA persists as an episome, which is correct for all three of these herpes viruses. The DNA is not integrated, it's episomal. It may not replicate in the case of herpes simplex viruses, um, but it may replicate in the case of EBV or HCMV, but it's certainly present as an episome. The other answer is B cells aren't essential for all of them, that's for EBV. Factors governing reactivation are only known for herpes simplex virus, so it's not all of the above. All right, the last uh, herpes viruses we'll talk about are called human herpes virus 6 and human herpes virus 7. And these are the causative agents of, of rather mild childhood rash disease called exanthem subitum. And here's a, a child with the rash covering most of the body, very much like chickenpox, but not nearly as severe. Chickenpox makes extremely painful blisters uh, over the body, and this is more of a flat rash. This is also called sixth, called sixth disease. There are five other childhood diseases in front of it, and this is number six. 85% of adults have antibody to both viruses. Again, another one of these herpes viruses that we all have, and we get them from our parents, typically, early on in life through respiratory secretions. Uh, the virus is shed in the respiratory secretion and it infects the child there, it infects lymphoid cells, endothelial cells, it infects the liver, the CNS, and salivary cells. So it has quite a broad tropism. Both of these viruses establish latency, like all the other herpes viruses that we've talked about. HHV6 becomes latent in monocytes uh, and macrophages and CD4, CD34 positive progenitors, these are hematopoietic stem cells that give rise to many other cells. And HHV7 becomes latent in CD4 positive lymphocytes. So periodically these latent infections reactivate. We don't know what the triggers are. They produce virus in an adult 
for example, we shed in the absence of disease, but then if we have children around or, or any seronegative person, they will be infected. So that's how the virus is spread from one person to another. With these two viruses, an interesting occurrence uh, happens, for, sorry, with HHV6 only, and that is in some, in some cells, the DNA, the viral DNA, integrates into telomeres. Now you probably know that uh, telomeres are the end regions of human chromosomes that are repeated sequences that are actually replicated by a reverse transcriptase so that the ends of the chromosomes don't get short. And they're replicated by telomerase and as we get older we have less and less telomerase activity and our chromosome ends get shorter and shorter. This virus in about 1% of people seems to integrate into the telomere. So here on the top right, here's the, the human chromosomal DNA in blue. The telomere is shown in red at the left end. Uh, below is the viral genome. And you see the viral genome has red stripes in its end repeat sequences. And these, are, uh, these have sequence homology to the telomere sequence. And this viral genome can integrate into the telomere to provide a structure shown at the bottom. So it goes right into the end of uh, the chromosome at the telomere. So again, um, about 1% of people this happens. Not everyone. It's not clear why it's only the case. And so individuals where this happens, it, is, it ends up in the germline and parents transmit the viral DNA to their kids. And then that viral DNA can be reactivated to give rise to viruses, will then inf which will then infect other people. So this happens only in certain cell types and only in certain people, uh, but it's a, it makes sense because you go into the ends of a chromosome, that's always going to be preserved. It's never going to go away. Uh, and so that's a good strategy for latency. And then you transmit it to your offspring. They're going to make virus and transmit it to others. So kind of a neat strategy for uh, latency and transmission. I want to end up with this slide, which is an estimate of the, what is called the, the burden of chronic viral infection in humans. So what we've got on the x-axis are different viruses, and on the y-axis, estimated number of infection, infected individuals in the millions. All right? So this would be the world's population because everybody has endogenous retroviruses in their DNA. We all have about seven to eight percent endogenous retroviral DNA. So that's shown here. This is everybody, the whole world's population. And to the left are other viruses, starting from HTLV1, which is a retrovirus that causes uh, human infections. Uh, hepatitis delta virus is a, a small uh, virus-like particle that goes with hepatitis B virus. HIV. So at the moment there are perhaps 35 million people living with HIV, so that gives you a, an idea of where we are there. Adenoviruses, let's see, hepatitis C virus, that's the number for that. Papillomas, hepatitis B. Then we have a bunch of herpes viruses, HSV1 and 2. Cytomegalovirus, now we're getting into most of the population here, Epstein-Barr virus varicella zoster, and look, HHV6 and 7 are way up there. The polyomaviruses are here as well, almost every. So all of these bars to the right here from about HSV1 on and on, 90% and above of the human population are carrying these viral genomes. And there's one on here that you haven't heard, anelovirus. Anelovirus is in almost everybody. It's a small, circular, single-stranded DNA virus. It's in your blood. Probably get it at birth. It doesn't appear to do anything negative, but maybe it helps us. So this could be one of these beneficial viruses. So let's think about this picture for a moment. We all have at least a dozen or more viruses in us continuously. Periodically, they reactivate to transmit to other people. A very effective strategy. Some of them cause serious disease, like the liver viruses. AIDS, others do not. This is our virome. So you've all heard of our microbiome, all the bacteria that are on us and in us, and people make a big deal of this. This is also a big deal. This is our virome, and this needs to be considered as well. 
you know, people are trying to associate our microbiome with various diseases like obesity and diabetes and uh, anything else you can think of, inflammatory diseases. This is being ignored. I think that's wrong because these viruses are in everybody, just like bacteria are in everybody. So we're slowly starting to recognize that we have a virome and that it can impact on us, whether it makes us sicker or, or healthier. The other thing is, I talked to you a few days ago about GWAS and SNPs, genome-wide association studies uh, looking for single nucleotide polymorphisms. The idea is you have people with a disease, you sequence their genome, and you try and figure out the mutations that are associated with that disease. People are now realizing that you can't just look at the genome in isolation. You have to look also at the microbiome, because if your bacteria are influencing your disease, they're probably <laughs> working together with certain mutations. So it makes no sense to just look at the genome. And I have to tell you that all the hospitals in New York City are, have started these huge genome sequencing projects because they see that's where uh, the money is going to be, but also they think this is going to cure disease. But the genome itself is not going to do that. You need to know the genome. You need to know your microbiome, because it's different in all of us. And I would argue we need to know the virome as well. Maybe a particular mutation will cause a disease only in a background of certain viruses or certain bacteria. So this is a different way of thinking. It's kind of complicated and multifactorial. And you know, physicians don't like that. They would rather have, yeah, you have this mutation in your genome, you're going to get this disease and we can treat it. But I think this is a great example of how you have to look way beyond the genome sequence when you're trying to figure out complex human diseases. 